got something real special for you today, Chicken Farrell. I got you in a special little town. You should know where it's at by now. I'm gonna talk geology of this place and I'm gonna teach you what you need to know so you can find your own gold deposits. And I got a big surprise for you at the end of this video. So make sure you watch to the end. <laughs> What is that? You know what this stuff is, so instead of me telling you what it is, you're gonna tell me what it is. What's this thing, huh? No, it's not a love machine, but it's operated off of compressed air, it could be ran off of steam as well. This is op opens the valves up for these twin cylinders. What do you think it is, son? All right, you see that across the ridge? That's the combination shaft, 3,300 feet down. You put it, no, no, no. What, <laughs> what, 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 what are you talking about? No, no, no. Huge sheet wheels, monstrous. Makes you wonder how they got them into position. <laughs> now the reason why they made them so big is because it cuts down on the friction on the cable. If you have a smaller wheel, it'll turn faster and you got more friction. So they put the largest wheels they could find at the tops of the head frames. Does anybody out there know what these are? They spin around. I don't think anybody out there is gonna get it. But leave me a comment down below and tell me what you think this is or what it is. This looks like a homemade skip car. Dude, this is a cute little skip. I could probably use this in my mind. There's a story behind this. This was dedicated to Billy Vargas Jr. He was a miner here. He actually did some work in here for quite a while. And there's some really interesting stories about this guy. I like the one about him trying to thaw dynamite in a microwave. That was a good one, blew up half his house. So the structural controls that were in place to create this immense deposit, which is about four miles long and about 300 meters wide. So you had faulting, brecciation, boiling, and magma in placement. Those are what created this particular deposit. It's classified as a hot spring epithermal deposit. You had these huge bonanzas. Some of them were 40 meters wide and they were 300 meters long. Huge, huge deposits of nothing but electrum, which is gold and silver alloyed together. Huge masses of native silver. The fault is the reason why this deposit is here. It gave the plumbing necessary for the hydrothermal fluids that are rising up from that magma chamber down below. The majority of your mineralization occurs in the brecciation zone. Now the majority of the hydrothermal fluids that were responsible for deposition here on the Comstock are comprised mostly of calcium and sodium sulfate. You're gonna see that a lot like especially out at Yellowstone National Park. Same exact type of model. And I wouldn't be surprised to see gold deposition down below. One thing that was a dead giveaway when the calcite was bladed. It's very rare, but I've seen it before. And that's a result of intense boiling. And wherever there was intense boiling of temperatures over 300 degrees Celsius is where the majority of the deposits were found. And that's a key as a secret. I want you to think about that, okay? And that's gonna help you determine where you're gonna find some of these near surface epithermal deposits that are extremely rich with electrum. I've heard a rumor that this thing was used in Virginia City, is that true? Yeah, it ran on the Virginia and Truckee Railroad wow. that ran from uh, Reno to Virginia City and so, then to Minden. Wow, so this is a class, this is an actual piece of history right here. Yeah. And it takes two people to operate this thing. Yeah, you got an engineer and a fireman. So the engineer sits over there and the fireman sits over there. Is that how that works or is it the other Thank way around? That's the other way around. Fun. Yeah, this is, this is really nice. It's beautiful. I can't even imagine. And you guys, you guys can replace the, the tires on these things? I guess they're called tires? Yeah. Yeah, there's a... Uh, By heating them up? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who is this guy? I found him in the mine. Is he a high grader? I don't know. Who uh, are you? Andre at the Collar Mine. Well, the Collar Mine was the fifth largest producer of the Comstock. Viewing 365 a day, so come down and check us out. We need you. Yeah, they need you. So get off the couch, stop eating those chips, and come down here and take a look at some history before it's gone forever. I think that's Slim in there. That's his original cabin. This is what happens to andesite when it's altered by hydrothermal fluids. And you're gonna see this all over the place. Now the miners refer to this as porphyry. And you're gonna see that a lot in your USGS reports. And they had a little phrase and it said, porphyry makes ore, and they're absolutely right. Ah, and there it is, the yellow jacket. See how they put concrete around it to keep it from burning? Because they were worried that the fire would come up through the shaft and catch the head frame on fire. And the shaft used to sit right there during the 60s and 70s they put a bunch of old beat up cars in there to help plug the shaft and there's really not much left of it right now 
This thing does go down about 3,000 feet. And then at the 1,600 foot level, there's a drift that goes all the way across to the east shaft, and then that connects to the Sutro Tunnel. There's a lot of stories about this particular area, and one of them is that this area is haunted because of the miners who died down there. And there's actual footage that people have caught supposedly hearing machinery running at night and hearing voices and stuff like that at night. What is this thing? I'll give you a hint. A lot of water. You put rocks in the box back here for counterweight. You always see pictures of guys riding it. What is this thing? There's one here. They sit inside of this thing. Can you tell me what they are? Without these, so many mines and so many mills would never have been built. On some of these shaft sinking buckets, if they don't have the ears or the trunnions on the side, they had this on the bottom. See this, this chain with this big plate. I really want to see if there's any smart fellers out there, not just fart smellers, but smart fellers out there that can tell me why does this bucket have this big old plate on the end of it, huh? I'm going to leave a link down below so you can give this man a call. I guarantee you're going to enjoy this. This is history you're not going to see anywhere else. The only mine on the entire Comstock load that's the original that you can still go into and see and all the relics are still in there. I answer the phone 24 hours a day, so give me a ring. So you know what I'm going to say, huh? So come on. On. Let's go! And it's even logged in on the National Register of Historic Places too. So we're gonna go in 400 feet all the way to the back, at least as far as we can go. It keeps going, and then there's a raise that goes up 300 feet, and I'll show you where that pops out. This is the collar raise. It's 325 feet deep, and it connects to it down where we were just at. You can see where they had concrete there at one time. It's right across the street from the Fort Ward. He's making a wooden Indian. Uh, I'm up in Virginia City. You can hit me up on Instagram at the Sugar Saw. My name's Paul Buelna. If you just want to do it the old fashioned way and call, it's 916 542 3478. Text or call, I'll answer. The Comstock was, was mostly a, a low to intermediate sulfidation zone, but there were areas of high sulfidation like you have out in Goldfield, and that produces a lot of kaolinite, and it's really nasty clay, especially when it gets wet, it swells a lot. See what I mean? Look at this. These are the original timbers right here. See that? And it's nothing but like mud. Now, this particular mine has been re-timbered many, many times. That's why you see sets about three inches apart. Like I said, the ground is extremely soft and it's wet all the time. It's making these, uh, these timbers sag, so they have to constantly keep reinforcing them. I don't know if you can see me, but I barely have enough room in here. So it's getting smaller and smaller. Look at that. Isn't that cool? There's about uh, 250, maybe 300 foot winds. And what's cool is you got the little bell right here. And of course your signal chart is right here. Isn't that cool? I've done many, many videos on the ore deposit here. This is the original Comstock ore deposit that I'm touching. I want you to see this, look, see that? I can dig it with my fingers. It's been altered so much from the hydrothermal fluids that it's extremely soft and it's still wet after all these years. When they first punched into this, it was a beautiful bluish robin's egg color. So it was really easy to spot it once they tapped into it. And then of course over here is the altered andesite that I told you about, what they refer to as porphyry. It's got that yellowish look to it. And I know you've seen it in mine dumps all around Virginia City. The miners had a hard time keeping the drifts and the open stopes open. So what do you think that they did to keep that from collapsing on them, huh? Let's see how many of you out there are smart fellers again and not just far smellers. All right, now back in the day, they had candles for lighting and they got four candles a day. Most people don't know this, but they had to buy their own candles. That's right. As far as the cavings were concerned, they used what was called square set timbering. And you can see an example of it right here. Dietersheimer came up with that idea. He got it from looking at a beehive. The honeycombs reminded him of a support structure. So he came up with the idea of square setting. He never did patent the idea, so he didn't get paid for it. But anyway, that's how they keep the mines open. A lot of these timbers are 12 by 12s and 18 by 18s. That was standard. And they got those timbers from the sea. That's why they're stripped clean of all their timber. As far as the water goes, what they would do is use these huge, massive Cornish pumps. And they were pumping out millions of gallons a day. The Union Mine had a 40-foot flywheel on it to keep the momentum going on that Cornish pump. Like I told you earlier, most of the mines went down to 3,000 feet. And that's when the ore stopped. Most of your epithermals are very shallow in nature. Mining companies were starting to get frantic around the 1878. So what did they do? A majority of companies got together, mining companies, and they created what was 
called Combination Mining Company, and by doing so, they created the Combination Shaft. And that shaft was basically exploratory, and you can see it on the southern end of town. They dropped the shaft 3,300 feet straight down. They wanted to see if they could intersect the very bottom of the load, because remember, the load is dipping down. So that's why they went across to the other side of the ridge, dropped the shaft down, trying to intersect the very bottom. But when they got down to the bottom, there was no mineable ore left. And not only that, but the temperatures down there, like I said, the water coming out is anywhere from 130 to 135 degrees. Men can only work in those conditions for 10 to 15 minutes at a time before they have to go to what's called an ice box or an ice room. And they'd keep massive blocks of ice in there where they would cool off for another 10 to 15 minutes before they had to go back to work. So it just wasn't economical to go that much further down. They were doing single and double jacking. Later on, they came up with pneumatics, which made drilling holes for dynamite so much faster. And they came up with this guy right here. It wasn't water flush, so they nicknamed it the Widowmaker. After that, they came up with this guy, which is called a jack leg drill. And this is this is pretty much what they use in the industry today. And you can drill anywhere from six to nine foot holes with this monker. You're probably thinking, Jeff, how did they blow it in sequence? They didn't have electric blasting caps back then. Ah, you guys are smart fellers. They're not just fart smellers. See these? These are called rat tails. Basically it's fuse sticking out that's been cut to a predetermined length. See that? And the powder monkeys had to know exactly what they were doing so that these charges would go off in sequence. The powder monkey, who was the guy in charge of loading these holes, his job was to know exactly how to cut that fuse because if he didn't cut it right, that means that these rounds are gonna go off out of sequence and they're not gonna blow this out of here properly and it's gonna cause a mess. It could even cause a bootleg round, which is a round that hasn't gone off. Back in the day before they had pneumatic drills, they had to drill the holes for dynamite by hand. So a lot of times you'd have a small starter bit. It's usually one to two feet long and you'd grab a hammer, Hit it, twist, quarter, turn, hit it, twist, quarter, turn, hit it, twist, quarter, turn. The reason you're twisting it, one, so that drill steel doesn't get stuck, and two, so it keeps that hole round. Imagine doing that all day long. And you'd had to drill anywhere from eight to 16 holes and load each hole with anywhere from three to five sticks of dynamite and then set that off. Now, double jacking is basically where you have two men. One would have the steel on their shoulder and the other one would stand here and they would beat on it. And you better hope that the guy who's swinging that hammer don't miss and hit you in the back of the head. The total production for the entire Comstock load came out to 260 tons of gold and 6,000 tons of silver. Just think about that for a minute and get your mind wrapped around it. That is a lot of gold and silver. And that is why Nevada is referred to as the Silver State. Right back here where that, that little concrete building is, used to be called American Flat. So in the 50s, they came out here and they, they constructed a huge mill that used to sit right there. And the thing was huge. They spent millions of dollars building this thing. And it was all state of the art back in the 50s. And they were using cyanide to treat the ore. So they figured what they would do is they would get up underneath this end of the load and with the new technology that they had at the day, using cyanide, that they would be able to get tremendous amount of gold. <laughs> they spent a number of years mining here. Unfortunately, they only got enough gold to pay for the cost of the mill. The boom was over. There was no more excitement. This was the great last hurrah, so to speak. And I wanted to show it to you because this is very rarely talked about when you're talking about the Comstock load. Another mining company came in and they said, there's gotta be some gold left in the Comstock. We've gotta find it. And guess where that took place? I'll show you. <laughs> See this huge open cut right here? This was made by Comstock Load Project. Hello! in about 2012, I believe. So what they did is they removed this entire section of mountain trying to get to the mother lord, la -e. They decided to go deeper because this wasn't good enough. This is only a surface ore and yeah, it can be rich. So what did they do? They drove that big old haulage at it in down there. You see it? See the big blower down there? Wow, look at that. And no, we're not going in there today, so keep your pants on. And now you understand how they got 260 tons tons of gold and 6,000 tons of silver. That is a lot. Now, after all that silver and gold was mined out of the Comstock load, it was put on rail and shipped where? That's right, shipped into Carson City. What's behind me? That's the U.S. Mint. That's where all the silver went. They came out of the Comstock load, they brought it here, the bullion. And then from here, they minted it into what? Silver coins. Are you following me so far? To commemorate the U.S. Mint and the Comstock load, what I wanna do is for the first 
10 people that sign up as a premium patron, I'm gonna give them this one ounce silver bar that has the state of Nevada stamped right on the front of it. You like that? For my premium patrons, I've got 10 of these I'm gonna be giving to you. All right, these are very special silver Morgans. Just look for the announcement on how you're gonna get them. So how do you go about getting these silver bars? Just look for the little icon that looks something like, looks like that. Click on it, make a $10 pledge, and you're in like Flynn. And if you're one of the first 10 people to sign up, like I said, you're gonna get this silver bar from Carson City. Ooh. And if you're lucky after you're a premium patron, you might even get one of these, yeah. So anyway, I'm gonna get on out of here. I hope you enjoyed the video. And if you did, smash that like button, boy. Smash it hard. And don't forget to leave me a comment. Till next time, this is Jeff Williams and who? My name is Jeff. Yo, me, silly boy. Saying, you like that Comstock silver? Well, I do too. Stick around, boy, because next time we'll give away the AU. Take care, everybody.